Good morning again. It's my privilege to introduce Audrey Deganzik, um, Dr. Matthew Deganzik's wife, who will be continuing our third and final uh, installment of our series, Vatican II, Rupture or Continuity. And uh, praise God for the way they're able to think about this together and help us to think about this as a church. And so Audra is completing her PhD from Notre Dame, uh, and her PhD is well, it's in sociology, and her PhD is on specifically on liturgical changes. And so she's going to be talking specifically today on Sacrosanctum Concilium, and uh, so that's going to enable us to understand this in light of these Vatican II documents um, and, and look at it from beyond just the, the letter of the document itself, uh, but how they're received from a sociological perspective. Um, so thank you, Audra. And uh, I'll just mention, I wasn't going to mention this, I was joking about this before, that it's mentioning that she's expecting and, and praise God, but she said so, so she'll be here with her research assistant, as she said. Um, and so, so praise God that she has all these wonderful milestones coming up at the same time. But so thank you, Audra, and uh, let us go forward in God's goodness. Thanks, Father Al. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to discuss Sacrosanctum Concilium, also known as the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, which was actually the first major document approved by the Second Vatican Council. While I'll spend some time describing what's in the document, I also want to give some historical context for what led up to it so that we can understand both the issues the document sought to address and the controversies about liturgy that continue to plague us today. As has been the goal with this series of talks more generally, I want to show how the reforms called for by Sacrosanctum Concilium didn't come out of nowhere, but speak to and with the church's tradition. This does not mean, of course, that everything done in the name of reform or of the document is faithful to tradition. As a result, we find ourselves amid such bitter disagreements about liturgy uh, that commentators often refer to them as liturgy wars. Namely, when it comes to diagnosing the church's problems, especially the drastic declines in Catholic affiliation and practice in the West, some lay blame on the liturgical form reforms following Vatican II, whereas others argue that people have left the church because the reforms didn't go far enough and have even been rolled back. I hope that some background on Sacrosanctum Concilium will put these disagreements into context. Okay, so what is Sacrosanctum Concilium? This document, promulgated in December 1963 by Pope St. Paul VI, was passed by the world's bishops by a remarkable margin of 2,147 votes in favor to just four against. It outlines principles and guidelines for reform of the Mass. After it was published, the Vatican set up a commission to implement the reform and together, the Vatican and National Bishops' Conferences made various changes. For example, allowing the use of the vernacular or local language rather than Latin in many parts of the Mass. Six years later, in 1969, Paul VI promulgated the Novus Ordo, or New Order of the Mass. So, Sacrosanctum Concilium gave the green light for the Church to embark on reforms to the Mass, including some concrete proposals for doing so. But that document itself isn't what instituted the Novus Ordo. The Novus Ordo came a few years later. Sacrosanctum Concilium is a long document containing both theological reflections on liturgy and concrete proposals for reform. So I wanna focus on three main ideas. First is the idea of the full and active participation of the laity. Second is the use of the vernacular in the mass rather than Latin. Third is the topic of music in the liturgy. First, the full and active participation of the laity. This is a buzzy phrase we hear a lot in discussions and debates about liturgy, and for good reason, because it's one of the key concerns of the document. Sacrosanctum Concilium connects the active participation of the laity to the theological understanding of why the liturgy matters. It draws attention to the intimate connection between the liturgy and our salvation. The document states that the liturgy 
is an action of Christ the priest and of his body, which is the church, a sacred action surpassing all others. No other action of the church equals its efficacy. The document continues. The liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. At the same time, it is the font from which all her power flows. All who are made sons of God by faith and baptism should come together to praise God in the midst of his church, to take part in the sacrifice, and to eat the Lord's Supper. There are two main points here. First, the liturgy is the most important thing the church does. And second, by virtue of being members of the body of Christ, it is an action we all participate in. The document then exhorts bishops and priests to ensure that the faithful take part fully aware of what they are doing, actively engaged in the rite and enriched by its effects. But in order that the liturgy may be able to produce its full effects, it is necessary that the faithful come to it with proper dispositions, that their minds should be attuned to their voices, and that they should cooperate with divine grace, lest they receive it in vain. In other words, it's not enough to just show up to Mass and sit there. We need to be praying it. So one of the key lines in the document is the following. In the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else. For it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit, and therefore pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it in all their pastoral work. So this concern with the full and active participation of the people in the church's public worship, especially at Mass, is the key principle underlying many of the guidelines for reform that follow. We might take for granted that of course it's not enough to show up to Mass, you're there to pray. To understand where this concern about full and active participation is coming from, we're going to take a little historical detour to the liturgical movement, which has roots in the 19th century, but really took off in the 20th century. In 19th century France, in the aftermath of the French Revolution, a Benedictine monk, Dom Prosper Garanger, reestablished Benedictine monastic life in a town called Salem. He was worried about declines in community and saw the liturgy of the church as the basis for Christian community. His congregation did much work to promote Gregorian chant in particular. Benedictine congregations inspired by Salem grew. Then in 1903, Pope St. Pius X's document, Trale Solecitudini, or the Instruction on Sacred Music, not only promoted sacred music, especially Gregorian chant, but also advocated for the principle of active participation on the part of the laity, in this case that the laity should learn Gregorian chant. In 1909, a Belgian Benedictine monk, Dom Lambert Baudouin, gave an influential talk at a Catholic conference, which in response passed resolutions promoting the use of Gregorian chant, the use of vernacular missals, and lay participation in Liturgy of the Hours at their parishes. Secularization was a problem in Europe, and there was a sense at the time that Christians were going through the motions and weren't really on fire for their faith. Monks like Garanger and Baudouin observed that even when people showed up to Mass, they were disengaged from it. And even those who were praying were sometimes engrossed in private devotions to the exclusion of what was going on at Mass. Garanger and Baudouin thought that, the public litur thought that public liturgy was the key to Christian life and wanted to spark and reawaken a love for liturgy among the people. To achieve this, the liturgical movement began to promote the dialogue Mass, missiles in the vernacular, special liturgical weeks and conferences, music institutes, and institutes on, of academic study on liturgy. I think this is something that we take for granted, but historically, the degree to which the laity have, first of all, attended mass consistently, and second of all, spent their time during mass praying has varied across time and place. That's to say, sometimes there's a propensity to think that when it comes to religious piety, now, nowadays things are bad, and in the good old days, things were good but it really depends on what good old days you mean and where. In the early Middle Ages, it wasn't uncommon for church knaves to be the site of business transactions, card games, drinking, flirtation, and even fighting. When the Spanish brought back tobacco from the New World, 
the popes actually had to publicly address the issue of people smoking, snuffing, and chewing tobacco during mass, either inside or slipping out during the liturgy, as well as priests keeping snuff boxes right on the altar. In the US context, even what we think of as the golden days of American Catholicism were far from perfect. In the vibrant urban immigrant enclaves of the 1920s and 1930s, mass attendance was sometimes less than 50%. In the post-war 1950s, Sunday mass was often not the carefully choreographed, devoutly celebrated liturgy with beautiful music you can find now at a parish that celebrates the traditional Latin mass. Instead, it was often perfunctory, with little or no music, focused on getting people in and out in an hour or less. My own father was an altar server in this era and recounts how when he was serving, the priest used to slap the back of his head so he'd say his responses faster. While mass attendance took a nosedive in the US and Europe after Vatican II, it had already been declining before the council. Now, we can certainly find numerous examples in the past of devotion and piety during mass that put us to shame and which we should emulate, but we should avoid assumptions about linear decline or progress. The story is much more complicated. So the liturgical movement was responding to real issues, but there were some twists and turns in this movement. Some scholars studying worship in the patristic era or the era of the church fathers began to argue that the ways in which worship had changed through the centuries, especially in the Middle Ages, were not just a development, but a corruption of liturgy from early Christian times, which they saw as authentic and pristine. This led them to disdain treasured liturgical developments from an, ent an entire period of church history. However, some of the scholarship about what early Christians were supposed to have done was not very rigorous. For example, one attempt to increase lay participation was to have the priest face the people during mass. This was justified in part by some dubious mid-century scholarship purporting that this was a practice among at least some early Christians, but we know that facing east was the norm for the, since the earliest Christian days. In addition, some who associated with the movement began to engage in unauthorized experimentation in the liturgy, which I'll get into in a moment. In 1947, Pope Pius XII promulgated the encyclical Mediator Dei, the first papal, papal encyclical devoted exclusively to the liturgy. In that document, the Pope encouraged the liturgical movement's zeal, praising the desire to help the faithful participate more fully in the church's public worship. Yet he also emphasized the church's authority in regulating liturgy and condemned excesses and experimentation. These excesses included using the vernacular without Vatican permission, omitting texts, especially from the Old Testament that some considered offensive to modern ears, using overly abstract art and architecture, and using a plain table as an altar. These are some of the same issues that have been debated in the decades following Vatican II, and we see them appearing well before the council. Later in the 1950s, Pope Pius XII shortened the communion fast to make frequent reception of the Eucharist easier. He also granted the US bishops permission to use English for parts of baptisms, weddings, and funerals, and he made important changes to the Holy Week liturgies. So as we can see, Sacrosanctum Concilium and the debates that arose about its implementation didn't come out of nowhere, and reforms had already been happening for decades. The church affirmed the principle of full and active participation, but what that means and what's required to achieve that has been something we've been wrestling with. Next, I'll turn to the question of the vernacular. Flowing out of a concern for the people's full and active participation in the liturgy is the issue of what language or languages the liturgy should be in. This is not a new concern. Originally, the Roman church's liturgy was in Greek, but by the fourth century, as the church became tied to the Roman Empire, the liturgy came to be celebrated in Latin, the Kyrie being our one Greek holdover. In the ninth century, St. Cyril and Methodius received the Pope's permission, after some skepticism from other bishops, to translate the mass into Slavonic so as to evangelize the Slavic peoples. And many of the Eastern churches have long-standing traditions in Greek, Slavonic, Arabic, Aramaic, Syriac, and other languages. Though, notably, these are typically older and more elevated versions of the languages than what people speak at home, and thus not necessarily vernacular. 
In the 16th century, the Council of Trent condemned the Protestant idea that the liturgy should only be in the vernacular, but it did not condemn the use of the vernacular as such. Indeed, much like after Vatican II, after the Council of Trent, a commission was set up to implement liturgical reform, and some reforms, like changes to church architecture, elevating, elevating the sanctuary and altar so as to be more easily visible to the congregation, were concerned with the laity's experience of the Mass. Now again, Trent did not condemn the use of the vernacular, but around that time, the church in Europe became stricter about using Latin. This was because one of the claims of the Protestant Reformation, which Trent was responding to, was that clergy don't mediate between God and the people, and thus the word of God should be translated into the people's language for their private consumption and, and interpretation. The use of Latin then became an important, important boundary marker as not Protestant. In mission territories where Protestantism didn't pose a threat, the church granted permission for greater use of the vernacular. For example, in the 17th century, the Vatican allowed parts of the mass to be celebrated in Chinese, Georgian, Armenian, Iroquois, and there's other examples. In our local context, in the late 18th century, Bishop John Carroll of Baltimore allowed a limited use of English in the mass. Sacrosanctum Concilium says that the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. But since the use of the mother tongue frequently may be of great advantage to the people, the limits of its employment may be extended. This will apply in the first place to the readings and directives and to some of the prayers and chants. Later it says, steps should be taken so that the faithful may also be able to say or to sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the mass which pertain to them. It was assumed that the Roman canon or the Eucharistic prayer would remain in Latin. The bishops, in consultation with the Vatican, were to approve the use of the vernacular in their respective national bishops' conferences. By the early 1970s in the US, as in many parts of the world, the entirety of the mass was translated into the vernacular. This was with the approval of the Vatican, though it was more than what Sacrosanctum Concilium envisioned. The question of language and liturgy has historically been a sticky one because of the need to balance grounding in a long-standing tradition with a need to adapt to contemporary circumstances. On one hand, we want to know what we're praying, and that requires either learning Latin, reading along in a missal, listening to a commentator, uh, translating the liturgy itself, or some combination of those things. On the other, language is a site of political power, which can create unintended problems. For example, in many countries, there are a multitude of language groups of varying size and power, so which ones get their own translation of the mass or which ones get it first can become a source of strife among Catholics. As recently as 2013, in the Archdiocese of Bangalore, India, a group of priests was charged with murdering a seminary rector over a dispute about language in the liturgy. A bit less dramatically, if you've ever been part of a multilingual parish, when the language communities do come together for mass, there's always awkwardness in figuring out which parts of the mass should be in what language, and it's hard to navigate that without privileging one vernacular over another, which can reinforce a sense that one ethnic or language group matters more than another. In a globalized world, it seems that there's wisdom both in using the mother tongue and in preserving Latin, as Sacrosanctum Concilium calls for. But in our implementation of liturgical reform, we can argue about whether we've struck the right balance. The last topic I want to touch on is sacred music, because I know there's a special place at Mount Calvary. As I mentioned, the restoration and promotion of, of Gregorian chant was important to the liturgical movement, and Pope Pius X instructed the church in 1903 to use Gregorian chant and to ensure that the laity could sing it. I think people often imagine that Gregorian chant was simply what the Latin church did continuously for a thousand years until its use stopped abruptly in the 1960s, but that's not exactly true. For starters, there's actually many traditions of chant, but the reason the liturgical movement and the popes emphasized Gregorian chant was precisely that it had fallen out of use in many places where it ought to have been used. In 19th century Italy, for example, many churches were using operatic music or setting Latin texts to contemporary secular music. While much of this music would sound elevated to modern ears, it was nonetheless not sacred music. 
Sacrosanctum Concilium promotes sacred music. It calls the church's musical tradition a treasure of inestimable value, greater even than, than that of any other art. And that's because it's an integral part of the liturgy, the church's public worship. The document continues, sacred music is to be considered the more holy in proportion as it is more closely connected with the liturgical action, whether it adds delight to prayer, fosters unity of minds, or confers greater solemnity upon the sacred rites. It continues, bishops and other pastors of souls must be at pains to ensure that whenever the sacred action is to be celebrated with song, the whole body of the faithful may be able to contribute that active participation, which is rightly theirs. Again, we see the centrality of active participation. Now, what kind of sacred music is appropriate? According to Sacrosanctum Concilium, the church acknowledges Gregorian chant especially suited to the Roman liturgy. Therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place in liturgical services. But other kinds of sacred music, especially polyphony, are by no means excluded from liturgical celebrations, so long as they accord with the spirit of the liturgical action. It continues, in the Latin church, the pipe organ is to be held in high esteem, for it is the traditional musical instrument which powerfully lifts up man's mind to God and to higher things. But other instruments may also be admitted for use in divine worship with the knowledge and consent of the competent territorial authority. This may be done, however, only on condition that the instruments are suitable or can be made suitable for sacred use according, accord with the dignity of the temple and truly contribute to the edification of the faithful. Likewise, in mission territory, it allows for the adaptation and use of local musical traditions, just as has happened through the history of the church. Again, even within Europe, historically, there were other forms of chant besides Gregorian chant. So pretty clearly, Sacrosanctum Concilium promotes chant and also endorses polyphony and the use of the pipe organ, since these are clearly associated with sacred music in the West, and what characterizes sacred music is its ability to lift the heart and mind to higher realities. But because sacred music is also is a product of culture rather than something that drops out of the sky ready to be used at all times and places, the document doesn't exclude the use of other instruments so, and styles so long as the bishop approves of their use and importantly, they must be specifically made suitable for sacred use. In other words, it's not enough simply to import whatever is being used in the surrounding culture because doing so keeps our hearts and minds tethered to earthly realities. So, when you hear stories from the late 60s about the Beatles being performed at mass, even where the document expresses flexibility, there's nothing in Sacrosanctum Concilium that authorizes that. So where does this leave us? Let's summarize. The concern for full and active participation, which we see both in the liturgical movement and in papal writings, and even going back to the Council of Trent, was responding to the fact that many Catholics were not fully engaged in the church's public worship and that this was hurting them spiritually. One response to this was to increase the use of the vernacular in the liturgy, which the church is variably allowed or disallowed through history depending on the circumstances. Another was to foster sacred music in a way that explicitly involved the people, especially drawing from the church's treasures. Whether Sacrosanctum Concilium was faithfully implemented after the fact is a separate question. There's no question that Pope St. Paul VI was within his rights as the Holy Father to promulgate the 1969 Order of the Mass. But we know that sometimes on the ground, principles like active participation came to be used as an excuse to do whatever one pleases. This is despite the fact that Sacrosanctum Concilium specifies who is authorized to carry out what kinds of reforms, and it even specifically states that no other person, even if he be a priest, may add, remove, or change anything in the liturgy on his own authority. Claims that Sacrosanctum Concilium itself presents some sort of rupture are used to undermine the church's authority, whether by those who express concern with preserving tradition or by those who use the language of rupture to justify making whatever changes they'd like. The liturgy is intimately tied to dogma and doctrine because it expresses sacred truths and it constitutes true worship of God. And even amid turmoil and controversy, we can trust that Christ will not abandon his body, the church, when it comes to ensuring that the church is validly performing this true public worship. <clears throat> 
But because liturgy is also intimately tied to culture, there have always been a multiplicity of liturgical rites. And liturgy has developed over time and place, and periodically throughout the church's history, there have been reforms. This means that sac Sacrosanctum Concilium is unlikely to be the last word on liturgy. Already the world is a much different place than it was 60 years ago. And as my esteemed colleague and husband, Dr. Duganzik, noted in his first talk, it can take many decades and even multiple councils to sort out disputes in the church. Debating how best to celebrate liturgy is worthwhile because of its centrality to the Christian life, but such debate should not lose sight of messy historical realities, nor should it lead to disunity. That concludes our talk series on the documents of Vatican II, so thank, thank you so much for listening, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them at this time. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question about um, clothing and costumes and the liturgy. Um, I don't think that the document talks about that specifically, but I think it, it does talk about enculturation, um, and it, you know, especially in the context of mission territories and evangelization. Um, and I think, uh, well, that's a place where, um, you know, again, enculturation is something that has happened throughout the history of the church because the church has been evangelizing you know, things that we don't consider mission territories now were once mission territories. Um, so a question of, you know, what's appropriate during mass, uh, again, th you know, those kinds of prudential questions, it's hard for me to, to answer um, in, in terms of particulars, but I don't think that there's anything per se wrong with that. I mean, so I'm Lithuanian, for example, um, and uh, uh, every year, at least when I was growing up in Washington, D.C., there was a special mass commemorating Lithuanian Independence Day. And so during, um, uh, during the offertory, I and some other children dressed in you know, traditional Lithuanian garb would carry up the gifts and everything. Um, so I, I think there's definitely a, a place for that. But again, in terms of what's appropriate in every specific circumstance is something that kind of has to be worked out. So, mm -hmm. that's a great question. So uh, that's actually what my what I've just started my dissertation on. So get back to me in two years. No, but um, uh, yeah, the question of, of how the the Novus Ordo was implemented is a really interesting one because again, there has been so much variation on the ground, even you know within every diocese and even within parishes. Right, you can go to one mass that's one style and another mass, it's a very different style. Um, my, my general sense is that actually over the decades that there has been kind of a, you know, a movement back toward more traditional styles. And you see, especially, I mean, part of the um, liturgical wars is sometimes, a, it's not just generational, but a loosely generational dispute between you know, people who remember what things were like before Vatican II. And as I said, their experience wasn't always very positive and that, you know, that was legitimate. And so, um, and then you know, there, all these different changes happen and then now people are saying they wanna change things back again and that's very confusing for them but it's also frustrating for younger generations who sometimes feel like, well, there were all these great things, why did you get rid of them, right? Um, so it, it, honestly, it, it depends so much on the the parish and the diocese. What I can say right now is that um, just looking at some of the documents from 
uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops from, you know, that, especially from the 60s and the decades following. It's amazing how many things were happening very quickly. Uh, and, I mean, I'm no liturgist, but um, even so, you know, I, reading through the newsletters, for example, about changes that were happening, like, I have a hard time even keeping track. And so I imagine that on the ground it was even more difficult. I know there's anecdotes about you know, people would show up to Mass one Sunday and all of a sudden, like, something is radically different and nobody's told them why and it's very confusing. Um, on the other hand, in that, so in that era, so there, there was a, some Catholics were, were very upset about the changes, but actually a majority reported in surveys that they were happy about many of the changes. Um, so, yeah, I, again, in terms of in, ter- in terms of how that implementation has happened through the decades, that's something that I'm looking at in my research. Um, but it has been just kind of it, a lot has happened in a few decades. Yeah, Kayla. Yeah, I, I think that's part of a, a broader issue of like, you know, how do you handle disputes within a parish just more generally? Because even beyond liturgy, right, there are disputes like that that come up where people have very strong opinions and, um, yeah, you want to keep everyone in. So, I mean, I think one of the most important things is to approach the issue with humility and charity and understanding. Again, a lot of, much of the dispute is about people not understanding you know, why do you want this and not that? This is clearly better. And like just kind of a, everyone kind of shutting down and not listening. Um, I do think that, I mean, so I think one, one thing is to focus on the essentials, right? I mean, if, if somebody is doing something in a liturgy that, you know, renders the mass invalid, I mean, that's a problem. You have to address that. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's something that's more like a, a musical style that's likely not to exist in 30 years. I mean, I don't know how much effort is worth trying to beat that down completely, for example. Um, And, you know, having experienced a variety of musical styles at Mass myself, honestly, I think one of the most important things is that those, that it's done well and with devotion and um, that, again, not that the type of music doesn't matter, but um, what's in, what's in the heart, uh, matters quite a bit and you know in terms of intention um so uh, you know again like not not coming in and steamrolling over people especially if they've been there a long time just you know having a a respect that's really important now obviously that's easier said than done and again there's always drama in parishes about that kind of thing um there's also been attempts at you know having uh uh personal special personal parishes that are not territorial parishes where there's one type of liturgy, this is especially true with the traditional Latin mass. There's benefits to that, but there's also drawbacks in that it can kind of ghettoize people. Um, It forces people to, you know, drive in from really far away, which is kind of a different parish model than the traditional territorial parish. Um, And so, you know, again, that's something that is kind of being worked through right now, right? Uh, How do we deal with this pastorally? Mm-hmm. 
Um, that's a good question. I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know in particular, um, but I'm sure that you can find, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to the pastor being level-headed about that kind of thing. So I'm sure that there's examples out there, I just don't know in particular. Yeah, so it, it's interesting because in some ways the liturgical movement did see uh, the West, you know, Europe in particular and the U.S. as kind of mission territory because, again, they, they, were, feeling, well, they were feeling like, well, even people who are showing up to Mass, you know, they don't get what's going on, like they're not really engaged from it. What can we do to kind of bring them into that more? Um, but you're right, there seems to be kind of sometimes an artificial distinction between what, what counts as as mission territory and what doesn't. The other thing is too, in these conversations, often people talk about enculturation as something that you know only started happening in the past few decades. But of course, that's, that's not true, right? Um, again, you know, even uh, 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 among Native Americans here, like there were all, there were modifications to the liturgy in terms of language, but without you know, but it still also was clearly related to the Roman rite, right? Like there was still Latin, the structure was still the same, it was still recognizable. Um, so that's, that's always been a concern of the church. But again, how to navigate that in particular instances is just something that prudentially, you know, you have to work out. And it's hard to, you, you can say, you can come up with some general principles for it, but it's really hard to actually say something generally about it because it is particular to, the, to each culture. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I think it was much more similar. So you did have a distinction between, you know, high mass and low mass, but you had that pretty much everywhere. And the only thing that would change is, you know, maybe the homily is in Polish or Lithuanian or, you know, whatever, or German or something, um, and maybe some of the hymns too. But I think otherwise it was, it was much more similar if you went to mass in, you know, rural Kansas and New York City then now, you know, two parishes down the street from each other could be. <laughs> and that is part of what we, one of the interesting consequences of what's happened in the liturgical form is this. It, it, and it's especially interesting because um, in many ways the church has become more centralized over time. And even this, even, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the bishops of the world overwhelmingly approved this document and a lot was happening from the top down. And yet, we have this kind of multiplicity of things happening on the ground. So for me, sociologically, that's very interesting. How did that happen? Okay, I think it's almost time for Mass. So um, thank you, everyone, and uh, happy Sunday. <laughs>